Michael Rockefeller. I think I can make it. Those were the last known words of Michael Rockefeller, the young American adventurer and heir to the prominent Rockefeller fortune, before he vanished in the remote Azamat region of southwestern Netherlands New Guinea in 1961. His baffling disappearance has since captivated the world, spawning countless theories and investigations. The youngest son of New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, Michael was not content with simply inheriting a fortune. Inspired by a passion for primitive art, the 23-year-old embarked on an expedition to collect artifacts from the Asmat tribes. The Asmat people, residing in a dense, swampy region, were known for their intricate wood carvings and headhunting rituals, a practice that was waning but not entirely extinct by the 1960s. In November 1961, while on the Arafura Sea, Michael's boat overturned. He and his expedition partner, René Wassing, clung to the boat's hull, drifting with the current. After spending a night on the capsized vessel, with land barely visible in the distance, Rockefeller uttered his fateful words, quote, I think I can make it. Opting to swim ashore while Wassing stayed behind, Michael strapped two empty gasoline cans to himself for buoyancy and plunged into the water. Wassing was later rescued by a passing ship, but Michael was never seen again. The official search for Michael lasted just ten days, after which he was presumed drowned or killed by a shark or saltwater crocodile. However, this explanation was unsatisfactory for many. How could a young, fit man, equipped with makeshift flotation devices, drown while swimming to nearby land? Alternative theories soon surfaced. Some speculated that Michael reached the shores, only to be killed by the Asmat tribespeople, possibly in retaliation for an earlier incident involving Dutch colonial officers. A more romantic theory proposed that Michael survived and chose to live secretly among the Asmat, shedding his past life and identity. However, considering the Asmat's regular interactions with missionaries and traders, it's unlikely such a secret could be maintained for long. Over the years, numerous explorers and journalists ventured into the Asmat region seeking answers. Some returned with testimonies from local tribespeople that hinted at Michael's capture, but these accounts often contradicted each other and were mired in ambiguity. This video is sponsored by Bespoke Post. Just like I dive into the greatest mysteries of history, I've uncovered another box of tools for curious minds. This is Bespoke Post, a monthly membership club delivering a box of top-shelf awesome goods from under-the-radar brands straight to your door. It's free to join, and you can skip a month or cancel any time. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based right here in the U.S. For example, the Forge Box features a Damascus steel knife from Buck and Bear Knives located in Pennsylvania. And the Explore Box features the perfect items for hikes into the unknown, like the lightweight Nomad packable backpack from Koala Tree, a water bottle, LED headlamp, and even some snacks. These aren't just ordinary items. Every month, Bespoke introduces members to an array of cool new products, from outdoor gear and barware to home and kitchen goods and more. How do they curate these boxes? It's based on a preference quiz you fill out. And while every box of awesome contains around $70 worth of goods, you only pay a fraction of the value. The lineup of boxes is ever-changing, and you don't have to worry about unwanted surprises. Before it ships out, you'll get a preview of your box's contents. Decide if you want to keep it, swap it, or skip the month with no charge. You pay only for what you want. Personally, I've been using my Japanese Nada tool from the Slash Box for daily tasks, and it's been incredibly handy for clearing brush on hiking trails deep in the woods. To support Dark 5 and get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter Dark20 at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com slash dark20. S.A. Andre's Arctic Balloon Expedition No one has lost courage. With such comrades, one should be able to manage under, I may say, any circumstances. These haunting words, written by S.A. Andre, provide a chilling glimpse into the harrowing journey of his 1897 Arctic balloon expedition. In the late 19th century, the race to conquer the uncharted polar territories gripped the imagination of explorers worldwide. Among them was S.A. Andre, a Swedish engineer and Arctic enthusiast. 
In 1897, he, along with two companions, Niels Schrindberg and Knut Frenkel, embarked on an audacious mission to reach the North Pole by hydrogen balloon. From the onset, their journey proved perilous. The balloon, christened Urnen, or the Eagle, was a marvel of its time, but an accident at takeoff would seal its fate. A faulty safety feature caused a thousand pounds of rope to fall from the balloon's basket, just as the crew dumped 460 pounds of ballast sand overboard. Suddenly too light, the balloon quickly rose to an altitude of 2,300 feet, but the low pressure caused more hydrogen to escape than planned. After only two days, the rapid loss of hydrogen forced the crew to land on the ice. With their aerial hopes dashed, the three men began a desperate trek southward, dragging their sleds, filled with supplies and scientific equipment. The outside world could only speculate about their fate. Andre and his team had vanished into the Arctic abyss. It was as though the icy vastness had swallowed them whole. For decades, their fate remained one of polar exploration's most enigmatic mysteries. Then, in 1930, a chance discovery on the island of Kutoya offered answers. A team of Norwegian seal hunters stumbled upon the expedition's last camp. Around it lay a trove of equipment, the ruined remains of the balloon, and most significantly, the diaries and photographic films of the ill-fated explorers. What the journals revealed was a story of endurance, resilience, and tragedy. Entries detailed their daily challenges, battling the cold, surviving on limited rations, and navigating treacherous terrains. As days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, the psychological toll became evident. With each journal page, Andre's writing deteriorated, both in legibility and coherence. The photographs, developed almost 33 years after being taken, offered haunting visuals. They depicted scenes of the balloon in flight, the men in their makeshift camps, and the bleak, unforgiving landscape around them. One of the most poignant shots was of the three men standing side by side, facing their destiny. Despite these invaluable finds, the cause of their deaths remained a subject of debate. The state of their camp and their belongings on Kvitoya gave rise to various theories. Some speculated that they had succumbed to the cold, while others believed they might have been poisoned from carbon monoxide from their malfunctioning stove. Another tragic possibility is that they might have contracted trichinosis from eating undercooked polar bear meat. While the exact details of their demise may never be known, the story of Andre's 1897 Arctic balloon expedition serves as a grim reminder of the perils explorers face. Amelia Earhart We are on the line of position 157337. We'll repeat this message on 6210. We are running north and south. Amelia Earhart's last confirmed message to the Coast Guard cutter Itasca sent ripples of distress across the world. The famed aviator and her navigator, Fred Noonan, vanished without a trace on July 2, 1937, during their attempt to circumnavigate the globe. This final communication, though enigmatic, offers insight into Earhart's final hours and remains a central piece in the puzzle of her mysterious disappearance. The message references a line of position, a navigational technique Noonan would have used. This line, defined by the numbers 157337, offers two potential directions, one southeast and one northwest. But what did Earhart mean when she said that we were running north and south? This could be interpreted as Earhart and Noonan's efforts to locate Howland Island, their intended refueling stop, by following a north-south track along that line. If they maintained this course, the hope was that they would eventually stumble upon the island. However, despite the expertise of both aviators, Earhart and Noonan never landed on Howland Island. Over the years, theories about their fate have multiplied. One of the most compelling is that Earhart and Noonan, having failed to locate Howland Island, were forced to land on the Japanese-held Marshall Islands. This theory gained considerable traction with the discovery of a photograph from the 1930s showing a Caucasian man and woman who bore a striking resemblance to Noonan and Earhart. In the photograph, they appeared to be under the supervision of Japanese military personnel. Proponents of this theory argue that Earhart and Noonan were captured by the Japanese, mistakenly believed to be American spies, and taken prisoner. Some even suggest that Earhart was held captive on the island of Saipan and later died there. But the Japanese government has consistently denied having any knowledge of Earhart's capture, and subsequent investigations into the photo suggest it might have been taken before 1937, negating its value as evidence of her capture post-disappearance. 
While the capture theory remains intriguing, it's just one among many. Another widely discussed theory surrounding her fate is the idea that Earhart and Noonan crashed on or near Nakumaroro Island, a remote atoll in the Phoenix Islands of Kiribati. This theory was first proposed in the late 1980s and is based on a series of compelling, albeit circumstantial, pieces of evidence. Foremost among the clues supporting the Nikumaroro hypothesis is a photograph taken in 1937, shortly after Earhart's disappearance, which depicted what appeared to be landing gear from a Lockheed Electra, the same model of plane Earhart was flying, protruding from the water off the island. Over the years, various expeditions to Nikumaroro have uncovered artifacts consistent with the period and could be linked to Earhart and Noonan, such as improvised tools, a shoe part resembling a 1930s woman's shoe, and a sextant box. Bone fragments found on the island in 1940 also raised speculation. Although initial measurements led some to believe they could belong to Earhart, subsequent analyses have been inconclusive. Many believe that the clues point to Earhart and Noonan surviving for a time as castaways on this isolated atoll. Regardless of the countless theories, the fate of Amelia Earhart remains one of aviation's greatest mysteries. Percy Fawcett You need have no fear of any failure. This was the final message Lieutenant Colonel Percy Harrison Fawcett sent to his wife in 1925, as he and his expedition set forth to discover the lost city of Z in the uncharted territories of the Amazon rainforest. These words, which carried a tone of optimism and determination, have since passed through time, underlining one of the greatest mysteries of exploration. Percy Fawcett, a distinguished British explorer and artillery officer, had a vision that drove him into the heart of South America. He believed that deep within the jungle lay an ancient metropolis filled with treasures and ruins, the remnants of a once great civilization. He referred to this city as the Lost City of Z. Fueled by fragmented accounts from early conquistadors, indigenous folklore, and his own previous expeditions, Fawcett was convinced of its existence. Accompanying him on his 1925 quest were his eldest son, Jack, and Jack's friend, Raleigh Rommel. As they journeyed deeper into the Amazon, Fawcett regularly sent dispatches back to Britain, detailing their progress. But soon, his dispatches ceased. Months turned into years, and there was no trace of Fawcett and his team. The last confirmed location was around the upper Shingu region, a treacherous area inhabited by isolated indigenous tribes. The enigmatic disappearance of Fawcett led to a series of rescue missions and speculative endeavors. Over the years, nearly a hundred adventurers went in search of Fawcett, but many did not return. Those who did came back with chilling tales of the Amazon's brutality and even more theories about Fawcett's fate. Some proposed that Fawcett and his party had been killed by an indigenous tribe, speculation strengthened by claims of indigenous people who reportedly had artifacts belonging to the lost explorers. Others believed Fawcett may have founded or joined a secret commune within the rainforest, living out his life far away from the prying eyes of the modern world. There was also talk of disease, wild animals, and even supernatural theories. Despite the numerous searches and theories, concrete evidence regarding Fawcett's fate remains elusive. The lost city of Z, too, remained undiscovered, leading many to dismiss it as a mere myth. However, recent satellite imagery and archaeological discoveries have reignited interest in the possibility of ancient civilizations within the Amazon. Cities and extensive networks of villages have been unearthed, indicating advanced societies that once thrived in these jungles. Ludwig Leichhardt L. A single cryptic letter carved into a boab tree in Australia's vast interior may be the final message and clue to the unsolved mystery of Ludwig Leichhardt. Leichhardt, an explorer and naturalist from Germany, made a mark in the Australian outback with two groundbreaking expeditions. His notes, safeguarded in Sydney's Mitchell Library, contain tales and observations of Australia's heartland, its aboriginal tribes, and the perilous terrains he dared to cross. After an audacious expedition through the Australian Northwest, he re-emerged in Sydney in 1846, crowned as the Prince of Explorers. However, it was his final expedition in 1848 that would immortalize him, not for its success, but for its enduring mystery. Aiming to cross the continent from east to west, 
Leichhardt gathered a team, including livestock and supplies, planning to cover the 2,800 miles between the Darling Downs and the Swan River Colony. Though the journey was ambitious and fraught with danger, Leichhardt's previous achievements provided confidence in his endeavor. Yet, the explorer and his party never reached their destination. Months turned to years, and not a single member of the expedition emerged from the expansive wilderness to tell their tale. The only relic from their fateful journey was discovered by an aboriginal tribesman around 1900, 